2023 has been a frankly ridiculous year for video games. For six months straight, I've pretty much felt like Neo in that I'm shotgunning all of the biggest releases from Final Fantasy to Resident Evil to Star Wars and Zelda just straight into my brain. And because of that, I'm sure you've been busy as well. In fact, I'm sure you've got a massive backlog of games from this year that you need to get to. I know, I know, I've been saying for months that I'm going to play Like a Dragon Ishin as well. But don't close that backlog just yet, because I've got another stellar game that you should definitely add to your pile. One that just so happens to be the most overlooked and underrated game of the year so far. And one of my personal favourites. If that means anything to you, that might be like the kiss of death. In fact, it's the best horror game I've played all year so far. And it's only six hours long. That's like less than seeing Oppenheimer twice. Called Stay Out of the House, this first person horror game from Indie Darling's Puppet Combo has actually been a long time in the making. Initially teased via a prologue entitled Night Shift back in 2018, which we'll definitely get to later, don't you worry. PC players have seen versions of the game in early access over the past few years before it released on the platform proper in 2022. Me, being a big dumb console idiot though, had no idea this thing even existed before randomly scrolling the recently added tab on the PlayStation Store back in June 2023 when its console version dropped. I'm pleased I did take that random scroll though because a month on, I pretty much want to play every single game Puppet Combo has ever made. I was completely blown away. Now the plot of Stay Out of the House is simple. You are the latest victim of the night shift abductor and have been transported back to his horrible old home. Think tea time at the Texas Chainsaw Massacre house and you're probably along the right lines. You wake up trapped in a cage and have three in-game days to figure out how to escape this house. But every time you're caught by the abductor who patrols the hallways, you'll wake up the next day in a new cage with the clock still ticking. So it's up to you to figure out why this menace is doing what he's doing in the first place and maybe even rescue a few other victims on your journey. Gameplay wise though, Stay Out of the House is an old school survival horror experience. And I mean old school in all of its meanings, as not only are we dealing with the subgenre's classic set of mechanics, those of course being limited inventory space, puzzles revolving around keys and items that open new areas of the level, limited offensive options, and punishing manual saving checkpoints, but this also applies to the presentation as well. That's because if you somehow haven't already noticed, Stay Out of the House does not look like a new game released in 2023. Rather, its rudimental polygonal design is intentionally evocative of PS1 horror classics. Not content to stop there though, there's also a VHS and CRT filter intended to create the illusion that you're watching a grimy old horror videotape that you found in your grimy old uncle's attic. It's more than a gimmick though, as the limitations of the older technology that it's aping here are used not just to create a sense of nostalgia, but to contribute to the fear factor. For instance, old horror games had extremely limited draw distances, so the environment and enemies would load in as you moved around. I mean, see the original Silent Hill for an excellent example of that. And as such, Stay Out of the House also has limited draw distances that serve to obfuscate the player's view. Not only does this brilliantly put the player in the shoes of the victims as they fumble around in the dark in a house they have no familiarity with, itself a terrifying prospect as your tormentor knows every inch of their own hunting ground while you barely know where one corridor will end and the other will begin, but it also invites the player to imagine horrors that are unable to be conjured by the low poly textures and janky animations. The effect is similar to how it was executed in the film Skinamarink, where there you had the VHS filter and you had the whirring grain of the movie getting you to imagine shapes within it that weren't really there in reality. It's the same here, you can't trust your eyes. Like, was what you thought you just saw an actual character model? Or was it just the grain going mad and your imagination going wild? Let's go back to how it actually affects that gameplay though. See, puzzles here usually amount to finding items and using those items on certain interactable elements in the world. It's a simple loop really, but one that's made truly nerve wracking because of just how difficult the game makes navigating and seeing what's right in front of you. 
Hell, the opening scene that I mentioned, when you're just trapped in the cage and you're trying to get out of it, I spent like 10, 15 minutes just fumbling around, having no idea what I was supposed to do, while getting killed because I stared too much at the TV. Which, by the way, is exactly how I want to die in real life. In reality, my escape was as simple as a 180 turn and clicking on a bent piece of the wire of the cage, but within the visual haze, that was way, way easier said than done. Thankfully though, this design never becomes truly frustrating because it absolutely could have been in the wrong hands. And that's probably because if you are having serious trouble progressing, you could just turn the filters off and see clearly to get your bearings. It won't make you instantly win, but it will make things a little bit easier so you're not just constantly fumbling around and not getting any progress done. That lack of power over your senses makes the game's enemies way more terrifying as well. Though there are, of course, indicators as to where the killer might be within the house, there's no guarantee that they won't just emerge from the darkness screaming and with a butcher knife in their hand. The sound design, of course, elevates the tension as well, helping accentuate the graphics and the animations and the intent behind them. What's most remarkable, though, is actually the game's use of silence. See, you'll go long stretches with truly unbearable quiet, listening to only the thumps of your character and the stamps of the killer, which are pretty much ever-present. Like the visual haze, though, this only draws you in further, getting you into your own head and overthinking everything. You know, just constantly going, was that noise I made too loud? Are those steps getting louder? Is the killer coming towards me? Can I even trust my own brain or what I'm hearing? And when the music and sound effects do come in, they are definitely worth the wait. The squelch of metal hitting bones, the barks of dogs, the screams of victims, all hit in their grainy, distorted quality. Likewise, every time the killer is alerted to your presence, which will happen a lot by the way, you're informed via an inhuman squeal that comes from him, followed by the quickening footsteps that are getting closer and closer to you. And genuinely, while so many persistent video game monsters like this become a little bit unscary because of how familiar you get with them and how many times you might get killed by them, this guy in Stay Out of the House, for me at least, Never did! Every single time I heard that horrible, horrible squelch and scream in my headphones, I ch my pants. <laughs> I really did, I really did. I was jumping all over the place. It was embarrassing. <laughs> And I'm laughing, but that's genuinely a thing no other horror game, for me anyway, has been able to achieve. To give you an enemy that you see all the time and make it scary for the entire duration. Okay, so that's a lot of talking about how the game looks, but how does it actually play? Well, really good, thank you for asking. Ostensibly, Stay Out of the House is just a game of stealthy cat and mouse. Like in a bunch of similar games, you hide from the killer as he moves around the home as you attempt to solve puzzles and unlock new areas. And while that format is familiar with a lot of hiding in closets, the execution strikes a strong balance between challenge and tension. Like I said, you will get caught a lot, but unlike a game like Alien Isolation, getting knocked back to a checkpoint won't come with that frustrating, deflated sigh, or at least definitely not to that extent. That's partly down to the potency of the killer that I've already explained, but also just down to the game's escape room style design. See, you're encouraged to experiment in this title, to try different ideas and work with the mechanics to progress, which means that every death is a learning experience, even if it sets you back a bit. You know what to do when you respawn. Even better, you do have options to either fight or just flee the scene, including a revolver with an extremely limited amount of ammo. Now, the gun is as much as a tool as it is a weapon in this game, being able to shoot security cameras or even locks off of doors, so it is always a genuine choice as to how you want to expend your limited ammo. For instance, there's this rotten old lady in the game who acts as a kind of watchdog who alerts the killer to your presence if she sees or hears you. Now, you could sneak around her every single time you have to, or you could risk it all and take her out of the equation altogether with one loud bang. And look, I don't condone elder violence of any kind, but I know what I did to that old lady. 
It's not as easy as that though, as the gun itself is incredibly cumbersome to use. Forcing you into a lengthy reload animation where you need to slowly chamber each bullet individually and make sure it's in the right place so when you pull the trigger, it actually fires and doesn't just shoot nothing. And it's a cliche, but this seriously does make every shot count, and you're always thinking about the best way to use your own resources. And I don't know about you guys, but that's the exact kind of methodical decision making that makes me love any survival horror game. Stay out of the house rewards smart planning, but also on the fly improvisation, making for a horror experience that demands you pay attention no matter what's happening. It also nicely rewards exploration, as bullets and other resources can give you the edge as you progress. And likewise, you never get bored because you're always dealing with something new, including great puzzles and twists, whether that's having to find a bunch of body parts to correctly weigh down a machine, or introducing new roaming enemies to make sure you never feel too secure or too powerful walking around this house. All of this is occurring as you piece together the plot as well, which is suitably macabre and satisfying. Told through environmental storytelling and a bunch of notes that you can find strewn across the environment, as you descend further into the depths of this house, the weirder things get without spoiling anything. Now, as you can probably tell, I really love this game. For £15, I think it's an absolute bargain. And I've tried to remain as vague as possible in the hopes that I might be able to convince you that it is really good and you'll try it for yourself. But I can't end this video without talking in detail about the moment the game completely hooked me. So if you want to go in knowing nothing more, then please go and buy it and then come back and watch this part of the video to see what I thought about the excellent Night Shift prologue. Or oh, don't, I'm not your dad, I know. Now earlier, I referred to the villain of this game as the Night Shift Abductor, and naturally, that moniker is explained in the prologue Night Shift. And what's kind of fascinating is that this intro plays pretty much nothing like the game to come, being a far more scripted, story-driven, I guess you could say walking simulator style experience. It puts you in the shoes of a different character called Deborah as she begins her night shift at an isolated gas station. And for pretty much the entirety of this prologue, nothing happens. You're given a list of chores you can do if you want, including sweeping the floor and putting items on display in the shop, and it's tedious, but intentionally so, because working a graveyard shift like this always is. Playing out this shift feels as mundane as it would to play it out in real life, but that is precisely what makes it so terrifying and so unnerving. I mean, who among us hasn't been somewhere alone at night and had our mind wander about what could be lurking in the darkness and kind of scared ourselves silly by overthinking about what could happen? And the longer the prologue goes on with nothing happening, the more anxious you get about every individual detail. You know something has to happen eventually. I mean, this is a game after all. It has to have an ending, and because of that, every single customer who comes through the door, you get suspicious of, thinking, is this it? Is this going to be the killer? Is this when the scare is going to arrive? Every car that pulls into the pumps attracts your attention, alert for dangerous red flags. Again, the silence of this sequence draws you in and leaves you with your own anxious thoughts, like, why did that van drive around and not stop? Was it stalking the place out? Or is this simply a red herring? Have I seen this car before? Why is it here again? And, oh sh**, did I just hear the back door open? Of course, all of this is building towards a jump scare where Deborah is indeed attacked and abducted, but the genius is in that build-up. The way it puts you in an eerily realistic situation, taps into real-life fears, and gets you anxious about the details, some of which you might even miss completely, as you can freely roam around the store at any time, makes the payoff so damn effective. If you just look at the scare in isolation, you might think, what's the big deal? But when you have this extensive buildup, genius. And that's just the prologue. That's like 30 minutes of the whole game. Man, I love this title. 
So that's our list. I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below. Have I convinced you to check this game out? And what do you think about this video? I'm hoping to get more of these out regularly, so if you will indulge me and you actually liked this incredibly indulgent video, please let me know genuinely because I would love to do more and I've got so much crap I want to talk about. And where else am I going to put it? Twitter's dead. While you're down there as well, could you please give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to What Culture Gaming for more lists, news, and editorials like this on the regular. Even if you don't think I've been Josh, thank you so much for watching. And stay out of the house!